1978, there were very few gay or lesbian bookshops. And in fact, very few books, because there wasn't so-called a gay or lesbian market post Stonewall. But that began to change in the 70s. By 1978, three novels appeared in America. One was by Edmund White, but the other two had similarities. One was called Dancer from the Dance by Andrew Holleran, and it was set on two islands, Manhattan Island and Fire Island. It was very successful, and by the end of 1978, it had gone into its fourth printing. But there was another book also set on Manhattan Island and Fire Island, but this was much more confronting. It was called Faggots, which in those days was a very derogative term for gay men. But it was called Faggots, and it was written by Larry Kramer, who a few years earlier had been nominated for an Oscar for his uh, screen adaptation of D.H. Lawrence's Women in Love, and he became a film producer, worked for Columbia Pictures, etc. Anyway, he and Andrew Holleran, at the same time, decided to zero in on the gay world, the gay scene, the gay life, the gay lifestyle, and they were not happy with it at all. In fact, they regarded it, really, as a slough of despond, a well of loneliness, a pit, a cesspool, not nice. So you can imagine that many gay people did not take kindly to these two books, particularly Faggots by Larry Kramer. I was working for Gay News in London at the time, and we'd heard about these two books, and we were intrigued because they were highly critical of the gay world, and they were written by gay men. So photographer Bob Workman and I went out to New York at the end of 1978 to find out where love had gone because the two authors were saying that love was impossible in this new gay world of fast food sex and drugs and uh, disco. I interviewed both Andrew Holleran and Larry Kramer. You can hear the interview that I did at the end of this video if you'd like to tune into that. Larry Kramer died recently. I was enormously admiring of him for writing this book, which I think has remained a very funny satire. Uh, Andrew Holleran has gone on to write other books and he's still alive and he's a very fine writer. But I have a soft spot for faggots. It's brash, it's bawdy, it's blunt, it's bold, it's ours. Thank you, Larry. I'm reading from a Gay News article from January 1979. It's called Where Love Has Gone, and love is in capital letters. I'm not going to do the American accents because I think a Britisher uh, doing an American accent is uh, torturous, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to read it in my normal accent. So here is Where Love Has Gone. It begins with two quotes. Over a long enough period of time, everyone goes to bed with everyone else. That's from Dancer from the Dance. The second one, how could he have made love to another human being and not remembered? That's from Faggots. Is gay love impossible when every variety of sexual experience is freely available 24 hours a day? This is the central question raised by two first novels which have become runaway bestsellers in America. Larry Kramer's bitterly satirical and sexually explicit Faggots and Andrew Holleran's precise and spellbinding Dancer from the Dance, the latter published in Britain this month. Both books are meticulous and deliberately chronicled excursions into the frenetic, ephemeral and imprisoning world of some gay lotus eaters on Manhattan and Fire Islands who dance until dawn, find sex easily, but are looking for love and wrestle with themselves and their sexual guilt when the drugs wear off. Most of them regard being gay as a deep, dark secret which they must keep hidden from the outside world. Keith Howes, together with photographer Bob Workman, went to New York to meet Andrew Holleran and Larry Kramer and tried to discover why an ex-Fire Island bartender and the man who produced and scripted Women in Love feel so ambivalent towards and critical of the lifestyle which they themselves appear to live. 
Andrew Holleran thinks that one of the main problems of New York is that the city is getting so late. He himself staggered home to a hellish bug hutch, hundreds of stairs up in a Greenwich Village brownstone at five in the morning and apologised if he seemed a bit, well, a bit of a diz for our afternoon interview. His conversation, chatter really, speeds breathlessly from one subject. How is London? To another, have you been to Studio 54? As we walk from his squalid accommodation to a friend's apartment, austere but clean and oxygenated, a few blocks away. He's the gay butterfly who refused to die. His world, until very recently, was totally gay. Most of his friends, a second family he calls them, originated from a summer he spent five years back bartending and doing, quote, all sorts of crazy things, unquote, on Fire Island. Some of the, quote, family, unquote, didn't make it. One committed suicide, two overdosed, and one vanished somewhere in Manhattan. There's a skittish uncertainty about it, as well as an enthusiasm and a searching interest in other people, but there's no shaking off the impression of a fleeting attention span and the kind of personality attuned to the current, the new, the fashionable. The success of Holleran's Dancer from the Dance has introduced him to straight women, isolated gay people who have written to say that they feel the same way as he does, and film producers who take him out to lunch and suggest that he enters his visits to discos as research on his tax form. Superficially, though, his life doesn't appear to have changed very much. He dances, goes to the baths, gossips on the phone, and looks at all the faces around Christopher Street. It's his world, and one he only discovered by accident. He was in Germany doing his army service, and friends dragged him to a gay bar. He was thunderstruck and couldn't wait to go to a local bar in Heidelberg. Across a crowded room, he saw a fine-looking blonde with a moustache who reminded him of the commander of the Graf Spee. However, he ended up in bed with a morose computer programmer, and the next day, Andrew returned to the closet. For a year, quote, I was so lonely, and finally I went to the main cruising area in downtown Philadelphia, where I was living. From then on, I was bitten in the worst way. I couldn't wait to get out of the office. I'd spend four hours in a bar to be with other gay people. And they were attractive gays, masculine gays, men. It still amazes him that he can go out to the baths and have sex with people and then just go off without a word. There's an ambivalence in this attitude towards casual disposable sex, which is common among gay men, and particularly those with strong religious backgrounds. When pushed, Andrew will admit that he finds much of the philosophy of sexual liberation, easily available sex, as one of the advantages of gay life. But then again, his own experience is at war with his Protestant moral teaching. I do think that sex is a superior activity, he says, and I believe, like Zorba, that no one should sleep alone. But I see the gay scene as being like dogs sniffing each other in public. Whatever his feelings, that respectability is the answer to gay oppression, Andrew is still drawn to fast food sex, as he is to the openings of the latest glitzy discos, the current and the new. After all, he had been out all night, hadn't he? In this city, there's so much available, he says. Like Proust, you enter a glamorous world and then see how shallow it is, but how glamorous it is as well, and it is fun. Except for the drugs, which he doesn't do. I don't think the experience is going to help me. It wastes my energy. It takes so long to recover from the effects. When I first came to New York, I found a lot of people's behaviour inexplicable. I wanted to go dancing and meet people, and I wondered why I couldn't communicate. Then someone would say to me, he's on speed, or he's on acid. Now I just want to go up to those assholes on dope and say, pull yourself together, be a human being. Essentially, like the characters in Dancer from the Dance, Andrew finds the New York gay scene alluring. Either you turn away from it, or you stay. Why do I stay? Inertia. I go dancing, I go to the baths, I gossip on the phone, I look at the faces, all that craziness. Sexually, he says he spends far more time looking for it than doing it. 
This morning's adventure? I was in a peculiar mood and the guy I was with found a limp cock. There have been a few long-term relationships, one with a guy who could only talk about cars and disco. At the moment, Andrew feels that if sexual love isn't around, then there are other varieties, affection, friendship, lust. His primary concern is writing a follow-up to Dancer and fighting both his natural indolence and a gnawing suspicion that he's written all he wants to say about the gay scene. When he wrote the book, it was like coming upon a little island in the South Seas. Now it's becoming almost like an industry, and to write a gay novel will no longer be as joyous or as breathtaking as it once was. Originally entitled Letters from an American Faggot, Andrew's publisher insisted that something less likely to cause embarrassment at the nation's cash registers be chosen. Andrew chose a piece of Yeats, one of his favourite poets, but to be honest, he says, I don't understand that stanza. Although not explicitly erotic, Dancer from the Dance is certainly not the kind of book he'd want his family to read, especially after an elderly male reviewer on a Seattle radio station told him, more in sorrow than in anger, that he just couldn't complete it because of the sexual detail. Andrew shares with many of his characters the same fear of exposing his real life to his family. My real name is Eric Garber, he admits, after a phone message, quote, for Eric, unquote, is passed to him during our conversation. I thought I could keep my two lives separate, but when the book was in the works, I knew I was on the Titanic and heading for a little iceberg, so the publisher suggested a pseudonym. The plan backfired because all Eric's aunts and uncles, knowing that he's now a famous author, are just dying to know the name of his book. It can't be that bad, they cry, during Eric's fairly irregular visits home for the heartland of America. Not wishing to be self-righteous, <laughs> not half, I allowed myself a morsel of surprise that somebody who wrote a book because, quote, there was no popular gay literature apart from Gordon Merrick novels and a few thrillers, is intending to create some positive role model, still has to play hide-and-seek, a game which means that there is no photograph of him or biographical information on the book jacket and television appearances are problematic. He explains, it's all tied up with Andrew Stroke Eric's desire that gays should be sexual free spirits in Hades, but good citizens above ground. Maybe the two are slowly coming together for him. I'm at the point of being morally self-respecting and still having a good time. I don't think the baths or discos are bad places, and I'd never have met some of my friends if it hadn't been for the bars. I love watching kids dancing and seeing the beauty of the male body. The difference now is that I've accepted all the limitations so that I no longer see the mirages. When I walk into a bar like the Ramrod on a cold winter evening and watch the freezes of people, I know that none of them are going to love me and take me to a cabin in Vermont. Larry Kramer, on the other hand, refuses to accept the limitations. He's an even stronger believer in love, romance, and the pursuit of respectability. All his conflicts are compressed fiercely and lovingly into faggots. The central character is Fred Lemish, who wrote the script of a film which won him an Oscar nomination and which all faggots revere. He's affluent and successful, but four days off his 40th birthday, a squidgy mess of anxiety, overreaction, libidinous fantasies, and hopeless sentimentality. Fred decides to embark upon a voyage of sexual discovery on which he will meet Mr. Wright. He's hardened up and slimmed down seven days a week, hard labor at the gym, become comfortable with anal intercourse and his oversensitive bowels, and all set to be the cruised instead of the cruiser. But try as he might to end up becoming a sour middle-aged queen, the wicked, raunchy gay world pulls him down, along with memories of a hated father, a cloying Jewish mother, a couple of closet sadist lovers, and five psychiatrists. It's a sad tale, if brazenly entertaining, and funny in parts. The poppers pop, trouser flies are endlessly unzipped, gym and disco owners grow rich in an ocean of semen. Fred becomes more and more disillusioned with the disposable sex and bouncing emotional checks. It's an overblown, picaresque spectacular, full of anger, 
prejudice, particularly towards lesbians and blacks, and a harrowing romanticism. Faggots pumps much harder and sweats more profusely than dancer from the dance, eventually dehydrating into a mist of half profiles and the odd funny line or sharp detail. Fred is the only convincing character, and although inefficiently I hadn't read his book when I met him at his Washington Square apartment, it didn't take me long to realise that after years, quote, writing Rebecca while thinking Rupert, screenplays for Here We Go Round the Mulberry Bush and the Oscar-nominated Women in Love, Larry Kramer has put all of himself into his first novel. He's a lovable, cuddly, small, newly muscular man with lots of greying chest hair, a bald spot, and granny glasses through which he sometimes blinks angrily or glares sulkily. He greets me at the door, half in and half out of his jeans, with his hair still wet after an apres jog shower. The apartment, spartan but expensively clad in russets, dove greys and the odd hint of gold, features a hammock and lots of expensive books. It's a long way, though geographically not far, from Andrew Holleran's hovel. Larry has good reason to feel none too well disposed towards the British because they seized one of six copies of Faggots sent into Britain for commendation from the famous Iris Murdoch, John le Carré, Stephen Spender, etc. Now with a book officially branded obscene by British customs, it's unlikely that publishers will dare risk prosecution by bringing out a British edition. In America, Faggots was mauled by the critics particularly the gay ones, who called it self-loathing and oppressive, but bought over 18,000 copies in hardback by the public who didn't seem embarrassed by the title, a generic term which Larry vastly prefers to gaze because he likes its, quote, chin-out assertiveness, unquote. Larry doesn't care what the critics say. I don't think my book is self-loathing. I think it's self-exploring. His hide is reasonably thick after years working for Columbia Pictures and a film with Ken Russell. If I never work with him again, it will be too soon, he says. And then there were the seven years in psychoanalysis. Did it do you any good? I ask, almost preempting the reply with my look of disbelief. Fuck you, he volleys. It taught me uh, the, uh, how to just be homosexual and help me tell my mother and and the family about it. He hasn't had an easy ride, and his strong sense of family and his need to create a secure home have been buffeted by what he's experienced as a gay man growing up in the 1950s. I see my niece, who's a sophomore at Yale and having problems with her boyfriend. She can talk to her parents over the phone about her relationship or over dinner. She talks and gets a lot of encouragement and advice. My niece knows that she can call her family if there's a problem. What did I have when I fucked a boy behind the bush when I was 14 in high school? I don't think it's very different today. I can't imagine a parent being open-minded enough to share in the experience of a 14-year-old gay kid. And we're paying the price for this. We are denying ourselves the right to love and be loved. Like a modern-day Jeremiah, Larry sees the gay world as a cesspit where love has no place. He seems to half understand the historical repression which creates such situations, although many American gay activists have seen his book as creating cesspits where none exist, except in the writer's guilt-ridden mind. The New York Gay Activist Alliance have placed Larry Kramer's name on its dishonor roll, along with those of California Senator John Briggs, Quentin Crisp, and Andrew Holleran, whose main character describes the realization of his homosexuality as being akin to finding out that you have cancer. Larry sees faggots and dancer as essential colonic irrigation for the gay world. Quote, things are better than they've ever been for gays in many respects. That's why we're zeroing in. We're the first two gay people who've come out and said there's something wrong. The lifestyle we're criticizing has become legitimized and we're suffering as a result. Not that he's against sex. We lead very sexual lives and certainly Faggots is a very sexual book. I enjoy having sex, but I don't particularly enjoy having anonymous sex. 
Larry contends that gays have been pushed into the quagmire from which few escape because, quote, we're always being scorned and shunned. Nobody wants us. It forces us to do these things in the world that doesn't reject us. But now is the time to drain the swamp. We've had to have everything available, the ultimate freedom, before we can question its validity. You have to have gorge yourself on chocolate cake before you know it makes you sick. So what does he want instead of the free-flowing relationships between men, which certainly in my experience can result in shared emotions of all kinds which don't evaporate along with the lubricant? Friendship, for example. <sighs> Friendship is better than nothing, he admits grudgingly, but I've had enough of buddies. I want sustaining, loving, interesting relationships and people wanting to be faithful to each other. I'm fucking sick to death of all the philosophy to justify what's going on. And what's going on is people not working at relationships. If two people have a relationship and go down to the mine shaft, a bar known for its obsessive ultra raunchiness, it's going to jeopardize that relationship. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to the mine shaft, but I think that having so much sex available makes love impossible. It's so easily available. And I don't think that any relationship can sustain the kind of extramarital exuberance that goes on. Gays must, Larry Kramer declares, pull themselves together. Heterosexuals could be our guides. I think that heterosexuals and homosexuals are the same. But I do think that in terms of their numbers, I see more heterosexuals imbued with the spirit of responsibility. Not only responsibility in relationships, but also in terms of being who and what they are. In the majority, I say. Privileged, I say. Better, question mark? No. Listen, I grew up in the South and blacks have come a long way. I think we're next in line. We're here and they're fucking well got to take it. We've constipated ourselves for too long. But what it amounts to is that we're never going to convince the world that we aren't freaks and weirdos if we carry on in this way. You must show heterosexuals that you are a decent person. Just like them? No, I don't want to be heterosexual. I'm born with a basic human need to love and be loved. I'm gregarious and intelligent and a social animal. I don't see why I should be on my own. <laughs>